Shalom and welcome to another edition of our Daily Bread where we discuss the weekly Torah portion. A Messianic Torah and this week's parasha is the fourth parasha of the book of uh, Devarim. It's also called Deuteronomy and it's called Re'e which means behold. And in this week's parasha uh, we start this parasha in Deuteronomy or Devarim 11 verses 26 through 16 verse 17. And the half Torah is in Isaiah, or Yeshiyahu, uh, 54, verse 11 through 55.5. So uh, my message for 2012-13 is called Seeing Different, Being Different. Yeah, it sounds kind of like a little song, I know. <laughs> um, anyway, my message this year, uh, really every year, of course, we look at the Torah portion. We look at everything going on. It's funny how so many things seem to line up with whatever events are happening during the week. There's always something that uh, kind of lines up with the parasha, it seems. Um, we get in this week's parasha, and of course we start off with uh, Re'e, uh, which means behold. Um, and what are we supposed to behold? Well, we behold the very first point um, in this week's parasha, which is essentially uh, that the commandments are a blessing if you keep them and a curse if you don't. So it goes... You know, right there in verse 26, it says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of Yorewahe your Elohim, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of Yorewahe your Elohim. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other Elohim, which you have not known. And then it goes on into to, to more details about their, what they're supposed to do. Now, it's funny because <clears throat> probably one of the most common arguments that I see uh, and that I talk about sometimes uh, when I'm talking to people in religion, especially uh, if I'm talking to Christians a lot of times, is this very concept. This concept of, of beholding, right, that the Bible and that Messiah and Mashiach, um, who, who they call Jesus, uh, I call him Yahushua, uh, it's, uh, it's the Hebrew name, um, you know, it's about beholding. It's how do we see the Messiah? You know, many Christians look at the New Testament and they see it one way. They behold it a certain way. Uh, I look at it and I behold it differently. I behold it, uh, uh, I try and behold it in the context of, you know, the historical context, and not just historical, uh, uh, the logical context, the rational context, and hey, how about just the context of the Bible? I mean, how about we just read the whole book and understand that the New Testament is one sliver, one part of a bigger book and, and put it in context because the, the context of the book matters. You can't watch the last five minutes of a movie, the last 10 or 15, and then say, wow, I know what the movie's all about. You don't, actually. You don't know why people are fighting, what they're fighting about, why the big uh, climax and, and, and drama at the end of it, where it's all wrapped up. You don't know what the context of those struggles were. What did they go through earlier on that makes this relevant, that they're overcoming at the end? What is it that... Uh, uh, you know, wh who is the bad guy? How do you know who the bad guy is? You see two people fighting. You don't know all that. Who are the players? Who are the good guys and the bad guys? What is it that they're fighting over? What's been the uh, origin or the uh, or the beginnings of the arguments or conflict between these two forces? If it's good and evil, whatever it is, how did it start? Um, why is this person right? If you have the bad guy in the end of the movie basically uh, trying to trick the guy or trying to be nice and stuff, a person who walks in at the last minute of the movie isn't going to know that that's not actually a good guy uh, because the bad guy is actually pretending to be a good guy, and they don't know that because they didn't see the beginning of the movie. And see, the Bible's the same way. You don't know who the players are. You don't know what's the good guy, what defines the bad guy, what defines the good guy, what is it? If you haven't read the book, you know, you can't come in at the last few minutes, the last chapters of the entire Bible, you know, which is a book about that thick, 
You can't come in, you know, into a three inch book and the last, you know, inch and a quarter of it and think that you're going to be able to understand it. And if you take it serious, you'll probably say, wait, if I, hey, maybe I'm going to give a review of this book. I'm going to read the whole thing, right? This isn't high school. You don't get to, this isn't college. You're not going to buy the cliff notes. See, religion for most people, just cliff notes. Religion is a student. Most people treat their religion, which they claim to be important, and just like education, it could, it could impact your future in a major way. Well, how many people go like the person who went to, to college or was in high school, and instead of studying and learning the material, they skipped class, right, because they had other things to do, just like a lot of people skip bothering to read the actual Bible. They skip reading the Old Testament because that's really big and there's lots of things and it's confusing and maybe it doesn't, you know, maybe the, the, the context they've been told doesn't matter or whatever it is. The bottom line is they didn't go to class. They don't know what they're talking about. They didn't listen to the lecture. They didn't read the materials. And they think that they're going to just go up to their friend who's going to tell them, hey, can I see your notes? Can I see what you heard from being there and listening to the professor? And maybe you read your book. I don't know if you read or not. Right. How many pastors and preachers people are listening to them? Trust me, most of them have not read the Bible. They have not opened up on page one and read it to the last page, you know, first page of Genesis and the end of Revelations. Right. I would bet that less than 1% or a half of 1% of the religious leaders have even read the Bible one single time, let alone study it, which requires going over and over and over again. I don't think they've even read it once. You know, if you, if you ask them, well, have you read the Bible? They might say, well, I've read the Bible. You know, I picked up a little something here in Matthew, wrote a sermon about it. Want to hear it? Here go. Uh, I've read, uh, all the, you know, the, I did a big study on the book of Daniel, you know, that's really hot. People want to, you know, find out what the prophecies are and revelations. And, you know, boy, we know us some Galatians up and down. Oh, yeah. Book of Acts. Hot stuff, you know. Don't try and make us get up circumcised. We, we, we studied that part. They have no clue. Okay. The people you're listening to don't know the Bible. I hear it all the time. I see people on YouTube. They're making videos criticizing other people, right? Oh, this guy's a false prophet. This guy's a false teacher, blah, blah, blah. Oh, don't do this. Oh, this is a cult. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Right? I can talk to them for five minutes and figure out when they misquote the scriptures, when they mix two verses together that have nothing to do with each other, when they ignore the whole context of a verse that they're trying to use for their own means and don't even know what that verse, what the context of that verse is and what that whole chapter is even about. You know, they'll forget the next second, which disproves their whole theory, the next sentence right after the verse that they quoted. I mean, it's just not even, it's not even close. It's sloppiness. You know, it's kids finger painting. It's like, oh, little Sammy made a glob. Yeah, it's not art. That's great if you're their parent, you love them, and you're going, hey, they really did a good job. But the reality is, no, we're not taking this down to an art gallery to sell it for some serious money because it's just little Jimmy who stuck his finger in some paint and made a glob on the paper. That's most of these religious teachers and all these guys. That's how I perceive their knowledge of the scriptures. It doesn't mean I know everything. I don't know everything. But I do study, and I can tell in a few minutes when somebody who thinks they really got it down and I'm like, you don't, you can't even quote it correctly. You're not even remembering the verse or you left out this whole part. How is it that, that you're, you know, boldly going after people when you don't have a clue about what you're even talking about, about what you say you believe, not about disproving what they, they don't even know the scriptures to support what they are saying they believe. It's like, at least know your own argument. You know, it's not about just bashing the other person, but you got to know your own argument, at least. It should be solid. And, you know, a lot of people don't. You know why? Because they're listening to somebody. They're listening to a radio show pro, uh, program of a guy who's also not read the Bible. And they're showing up to the mega church to listen to their pastor go on for three hours. He'll read one sentence out of the scriptures 
throw in another sentence somewhere uh, at two and a half hours later and tell all kinds of jokes and talk all kinds of stuff about life lessons and all this. And it's, it's, it's a personal uh, development seminar. Oh, yeah. And, oh, we got a full concert. And, well, let's strike up the uh, two big screens. And we got a $25,000 sound room. And, oh, hey, everybody, do you feel it? Can you feel the spirit? Woo! Right? There's no word of God there. And that guy hasn't read the book. I could sit down with him, ask him 25 questions. I can tell you right now, my my kid, who's not even 10 years old yet, could sit down there and tell you bullet point by bullet point what Parashah Re'eh is about. What was last Parashah about? What's, what's, what's this? How's it work? What are the Ten Commandments? I could come up with what are essentially elementary um, questions, and... Almost any one of my kids could sit there and rattle them off. Well, I can go run into a messianic synagogue and get their uh, big hot shot that's standing up in there that's uh, leading the congregation, protecting the flock from bad theologies, and I could ask him, you know what? Not even half of them can remember and tell you all Ten Commandments in order. Hello? This is the foundation of the faith, and you don't know them, but you're up there in the room blabbing and telling people, how this guy's a false prophet, and how you know everything, and blah, blah, blah. It's ridiculous. I ask him about the parashah. Hey, what's this week's parashah about? Oh, I don't know. Well, let me pull a seven-year-old over here. He can tell you. That should embarrass people. Come on. And you know what? Even more embarrassed should be the people who are sitting in the seats listening to those people. Because they're like, hey, I'm too lazy to read it. But you know what? Hey, brother. Hey, rabbi. Oh, you gave a great message this week. They don't know. They don't know that their rabbi never read the Bible from cover to cover. They don't know that their pastor never read the Bible from cover to cover even once. They don't know that their Bible or pastor or whatever doesn't even know the basics, right? They just assume that he's up there talking, so he probably knows everything. It's like, no, he read three paragraphs and wrote a message about something. That doesn't mean he knows anything about the basic of, what, uh, of what's going on. And people follow them. How much more so are they removed then? Right? It's like the scriptures say, if the righteous are scarcely saved, what then of those who do evil? Well, I can tell you what then. They're, they're in big trouble. They're in huge trouble. Right? Because the righteous ones are scarcely saved. And I see that same pattern. We see the same pattern with the religious leaders. If they don't know the Bible, and they're the ones teaching everybody else, then how much less do the other people know? And then you get the zealous uh, 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 the wife of somebody, right? I don't know how many times I've been in a congregation, right? And we got these uh, flip-flop relationships where, you know, the guy's all, all timid and passive, and, and the woman, she knows every all the Bible, and she's, and, you know, I've had it before where I was sitting there talking to someone. Hey, blah, 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 blah. We're talking about something. And what's this in my ear? You know? Here comes some lady. Hey, lady. Right? And she just starts going off. Oh, you need to talk to a rabbi. You don't know that. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, oh, hi. How are you? Who, who are you? You know, what are your comments? What do you have to say? And see, she's sitting there yapping in my ear, telling me, oh, you need to talk to a rabbi. Like, they're going to set you straight. And it's like, I'm sorry, I don't play that game. I don't play the, I don't know anything. I'll let some other imperfect man tell me what I should believe about the word of God. I'm sorry. I read the word of God. I study it. I got a pair of eyes. We thank God, right? I'm not blind. I can read. So therefore, I try and use those eyes. And I use that brain. And I use that time, which is more important, that God gives everybody. God gives everybody 24 hours. Right? How do you use them? He doesn't give me more. If I study more than somebody else, it's not because he said, hey, here's another five hours every day. Shh. Don't tell the others. It don't work like that. I invest my time, just like everybody else invests their time, in whatever their heart 
lust after. Mine may be to study the Torah. Mine may be to try and understand the Word of God and to try and figure it out so I can try and do it and teach it to my kids, teach it to my wife. You know, the fact is, other people say, hey, I can't do that. I got a TV dinner in the oven. I got to watch Everybody Loves Raymond. I don't know. I don't know how, you know, I build model trains. I got to do that. And if it isn't that, it's something else. Plus, I got to go to work. Plus, I got a uh, waxed car. I don't know. And I got to take the garbage out. There's got to be time for doing uh, dishes. And then we're going to go to the park. I have no idea how people fill up their day. The fact is, you have to make time. For the scriptures you have to make time for God you have to invest some of that time you were going to invest somewhere else if somebody invests hours and months and years and decades of their life into something it should yield something a workman's worthy of their hire right the diligent hand right works the field and uh, I'm not even gonna go well we are gonna go into that I'm gonna go into that in a little bit when we talk about the poor because we have some funny things um, going on this week with with uh, lively conversation um, about a situation where we were asking for help and I'm sure there's some people out there oh well you know oh you know what are you doing why that why should I help you oh are you you know did you did you sell off all your stuff you know uh, how many job applications have you put in you know what have you done there and, and, and it becomes a, a an audit you know, and we're going to, and this week's parish addresses that. It addresses a whole huge section when we get to that about what we're to do and how we're to act when somebody asks for help. And see, the thing is, you've got to understand, everybody's got their own idea and everybody does what exactly they want to do, and that's fine. But, you know, let's look at the difference. I mean, this one's easy. Okay. Uh, we, you know, we've ran into different troubles over the years, you know, financial troubles. And we've also had times when we were doing fine. And we've had many times that we were doing fine. And uh, at the end of the day, that doesn't have anything. You can't blame that on why you help somebody or, or not. You can't blame why you study Torah or not. As a matter of fact, I do more projects and probably work longer days than a lot of people do. And I've had many different careers that require different um, hourly investments. You know, some of them that are just brutal. You know, where you're working all day, you're working all night, you got to be there in the morning again and they don't care. And, and uh, you know, that's just the way it goes. And uh, there's other uh, things that, that don't require that much and all that is part of what you do but that's the whole goal it didn't matter if you have a little time or a lot of time you got 24 hours why you have that time that's up to you sometimes sometimes life puts you in one uh, direction and, and another you still have choices you can make but the fact is is that if something's important to you you still make it happen I've had times when I've been so busy it's ridiculous there's no way I can get everything done I still study my Torah. And the great thing is, Yodei Wahe blesses us. He blesses us by giving us a whole day off. For most people, they spend two-thirds of their day at work, okay, trying to earn their wages, earn a living, whatever it is, get ahead, build something for their kids. There's many things people can do, but the fact is, is that it takes up the majority of their waking hours. Moms are busy too. Moms go out there, they're taking care of the kids. Uh, some moms out there, they've got a career too. Maybe there's no kids. Maybe maybe the kids are sent off somewhere and both parents are off doing their own thing, right? I mean, no one can blame the world ultimately on the time that they choose to spend. Ultimately, we all choose to do it. Whether you're digging a ditch or you're a CEO of a company, and uh, you're making business decisions on the golf course. It doesn't matter. Those are all decisions and situations that we get ourselves into and, and choices we make. And at the end of the day, we always have 
the Word of God available to us. We can always spend five minutes here listening to an audio tape there if you have no time to read. I mean, there's just no excuse anywhere. And then on top of it, God gives us a whole day where we can put aside the biggest thing that takes all of our time. And he's saying, okay, boom, that's, that's a sight. Don't even have to worry about that. So that two thirds of your day that you would normally spend for there, I just replaced that. Now you have time. If nothing else, if you're the busiest person and you just refuse to make any time during the week for God, it's okay. Because at the Sabbath, God makes the time. God eliminates the need to try and compete with the worldly ways and earning a living and making money or your hobby or your business or whatever it is. That a person does. It doesn't matter if they're retired or whatever. It doesn't matter. One time a week, you're guaranteed an open slot. So you one time a week, you got no excuses to do no study. And see, people still don't do it. People show up. They go, well, I'm going to go, go to the congregation. I'm going to go to the synagogue, whatever. I'm going to go to church. And they don't personally do any study. They count that as their study. You see, they go all passive on it. Well, I'm not going to study it during the week. And hey, by the way, even in the time that you've allotted for me as a fail-safe to make sure that I can study and make sure that I can get some of that time, I'm going to sit and listen to really good music in a half million dollar or four million dollar mega church where they got a really great band, or I'll be in a messianic synagogue and we'll be doing Davidic dance and we'll be doing all this. I'm going to do everything, mm -hmm. except for study your word. Right? Even if you have to say, hey, wait, wait, you know what? We're going to have to leave early or I'm going to have to show up late to the meeting because you know what? Or I'm going to have to wake up an hour early because today is a day that at a minimum, I'm responsible for doing some study. I'm responsible for thinking about the word of God and digging into the word of God and, and, and doing that. Not just showing up for Davidic dance, not just showing up for the concert, not just showing up for the prayers, not just showing up to hear the teacher, preacher, rabbi uh, tell me a little bit about secondhand information when that guy doesn't even know probably a lot of what he's talking about. They don't know that because they're so far removed from studying the scriptures that they wouldn't know how smart their preacher, or pastor, or rabbi is. I might come in sit in the back and think, wow, that's a bunch of garbage. Wow, he misquoted that. Uh, I don't see how he's making that conclusion because you'd have to totally forget these parts of the, you know. That's typically what it's like if I'm sitting there listening to somebody speak on the Torah. I'm trying to glean all the things, see what they're saying, pull meaning out of it, learn, be corrected, all this, but it's always being you know, ran across the Torah. And does that line up with the Torah? Does that line up with the scriptures? Did they quote that accurately? Is he, is he correctly utilizing, putting that in the right context? These are the tests that you're constantly doing as you're listening to other people. How can you do those tests if you don't have any personal knowledge of the scriptures yourself? you got to get that book up in here. You need to get it up there. Because your brain is a beautiful and wonderful thing. Your brain cycles it all together. Your brain organizes it in a way and defragments it and puts it together and connects different pieces and, and makes it logical and makes it in uh, makes you be able to see patterns and all these beautiful, wonderful fruits of studying the Torah. It's like, oh my goodness, look at what this seed, the word of God, did when I put it in me, right? No, you're not the parable of the sower? Right? That's what it says. How then will you know all parables? That's what the Messiah said. Because the most important first thing that we learn is what happens when the Word of God goes inside us. And we're all different. There's different soils. And that affects what comes out. But one thing that's crazy and one thing that's awesome is the seed, the Word of God, is amazing. And it produces amazing fruit. Oh yeah, all the holy rollers and all the uh, evangelical people, they're like, woo! You know, and the Pentecostals, they're like, ah, you know, they get real jazzed up. Me, I'm not as much of a overly jazzed up 
kind of person. Feelings can not always, people always say, well, God told me this. It's just their feeling. They thought about it and got a strong feeling and they said, well, then that must be God telling me something. Well, you need to learn to discern the voice of God and your own voice. Now, if you need a little bit of help, just read your Bible. Because when God spoke, we have accounts of that. And you can see what happened. People didn't say, ooh, God spoke to me, so I decided I should be the dance leader. Or God spoke to me and told me I should start up a ministry in North Dakota. Okay? That's not typically how it works. Or God told me in a dream who the third writer of the apocalypse was and that it was North Korea. And now it's going to be, you know, you see all that stuff floating around. And it's like, really? Because that's weird because I don't really see that pattern in the scriptures too much. Um, I see when God talked to Israel and they all thought they were going to die and said, please don't talk to us. We want to talk to Moshe which also represents the letter of the Torah, saying, God, don't talk to us. I'd rather go back to your written word. That's what the pattern creates. You know, They don't want to talk directly to God because they were sure they were going to die just hearing his voice. And that's something I never hear. All the people go, oh, yeah, you know, uh, I had a dream and God told me X, Y, Z. What I never hear is, I had a dream. I thought I was going to die. I woke up shaking, thinking, I'm dead. I'm a dead person. Am I still alive? I didn't know if I was alive. Oh, what was the dream about? God was saying something to me. You never hear that. You never see the clues and the signs that are consistent with what the scriptures are. You don't behold, right? This whole parasha is called re'e, behold. How come people can't see these things? You know, we see patterns, we see details, and then when someone else says something, and I don't see the patterns and the details there that are consistent with the patterns and the details of the scriptures they're quoting or of the whole scriptures in context, then a red flag goes up and I say, hmm, that's weird because that sounds really different than what this thing that I'm studying on a daily basis is saying. So let's let's compare it to I mean if you're right hey show me 10 different ways show me show me the word of God what I'm missing but that's usually not the case the case is usually that those things aren't there because it's the sign and we're going to get into that into this week's parish on this week's parish on my message is called seeing different being different okay those are two things that need to happen right it's so funny to me that when we say uh, when we look at what makes us different. See, we're sharing the world. But guess what? In the times of the Bible, they shared the world with other people too. The Palestine, right? Heathen nations, pagans, the Amory, the Yevisi, the Hittites, the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians, right? There's all kinds of people on the planet, even in the area that they're at, and even in the promised land that they're going to go to, and even in the wilderness that they're coming through, and even in where they were at when they were in Egypt. Mitzrayim. There's all kinds of people there. They're constantly surrounded by other people. So what makes them different? Why are they the children of Israel? Why are they able to assemble? Why are they God's people? Why do they deserve to go into the promised land? Why are they being singled out of other nations? What doesn't make them part of those nations? And why aren't they just, you know, uh, other people? You know, he didn't come out and say, well... Uh, if your name's, uh, uh, you know, Jimmy, let's let's get all the Jimmys and the Steves out of there, right? That's what makes you special. Or, hey, everybody with brown hair, right? That's, that's not what happened. As a matter of fact, there's all kinds of people, mixed multitude, um, that God has drawn to himself, okay? And what is it that they had in common? You see, that's the big question. What makes a person go into that kingdom? If they're a Christian, they think they're going into heaven. Um, even more accurately, they would have to probably think about the kingdom of heaven, not that actually going to heaven. Um, I don't think they're going to be able to substantiate that. The kingdom of heaven is different. The kingdom, the special kingdom that's made, the new Jerusalem, uh, uh, the promised land, all that kind of stuff. Um, but again, it's just they don't notice the details because they're not re'e. They're not beholding, right? They're sloppy. They didn't really see. 
in many ways, like Mashiach said, they're blind, right? What was one of the big signs that Messiah did when he came back? He says, go tell Johan and go tell John. He's like, what will I tell him? And, you know, to let him know that you are here. Tell him the blind see and the lame walk. Okay? That's an indicator about who the people were and how the people had changed. When the truth, the word of God comes, you'll know because people will change. If people aren't changing, then they got a non-Messiah. It's a non-event. They got a false Messiah or something. But people aren't changing. You see, the whole concept of the gospel is to repent. It's when a person changes. A person who was a liar goes from a wheat or a tear, child of Satan, to becoming not a liar and becomes a child of God. You see, there's only two fathers in that parable, the wheat and the tares. And just like the people came up and said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're the seed of Abraham. He didn't go like, well, sweet, glad to know you, bro. Uh, no. He said, you're of your, if you were Abraham's seed, you would have Abraham's works. He didn't say if you were Abraham's seed, you'd have Abraham's faith. He didn't say if you were Abraham's seed, you'd be in, the, in the, the synagogue every week. He didn't say, uh, well, if you were Abraham's seed, you'd believe in me. Uh, at the time, they didn't believe in him. So it doesn't matter whether you come at it from a messianic or a Jewish or a Christian standpoint. The confrontation between these people claiming to be somebody and him came down to what he said was their works. Just as it says in Revelations, he'll open up the, the book of life and judge every man according to their works. That's exactly what he did when the people came to him and said, we're of our father, you know, of the seed of Abraham. He said, if you were of your... Uh, if you were the seed of Abraham, you'd have Abraham's works. I could measure that. Let me look. First thing he did, look at their works. Judge their works and say, no, it doesn't line up. So no matter what you say, no matter what lineage you have, no matter what garments you wear, no matter what you claim, no matter what organization you have, no matter what, what robes, how you dress like, what you look like, all your friends who all hang out and say, yeah, high five, we're the seed of Abraham. We, we're in actually a special group. We're called the Abrahamic uh, seed of power. I, it doesn't matter what you do. None of that means anything before God and before the word of God. The word of God measures your deeds. It sets a standard and then measures you against it. And so it was easy to go, hmm, no. Now, it would be great if those guys repented from when he says, you're of your father, the devil. It would be great if they repented because you don't have to stay, right? You don't have to choose to do wickedness. You can actually change that, boom, and be of your father, the father in heaven, by obeying him. It's easy. I mean, it's that easy. So that's the whole thing that when we look at all these things and we ask ourselves, what makes us different? What identifies us? Well, the scriptures right here tell us right from the beginning. I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you have the faith of Jesus? No. Well, technically, yes. Because what was the faith of Jesus? Obedience to his father's commandment. If he didn't obey his father's commandment and the only Bible that existed at the time, which was the Old Testament, then he wouldn't be perfect. He wouldn't be the, the lamb, uh, you know, the Passover lamb. He wouldn't be the, the, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. All the things even that the Christians believe that Jesus is to them, wouldn't be made possible if he didn't perfectly obey the Father's law. If he's not perfect and he's a sinner, then he's just like anybody else. And many people in history have claimed to be the Messiah. Not only back then, it'll come again, even the scriptures say, there'll be many false messiahs. So the fact is, is that would mean nothing. He would mean nothing. His words would mean nothing if he didn't fully obey 
and keep the commandments of God and even salvation and even helping others even if we just take the Christian way of thinking and the doctrine of how they th what they think it means what they've been told it means by pastors who've never read the whole Bible even in the majority of the time it's just it's just an ignorant person passing on lies to even more ignorant people who thought the person in front of the room understood it and wasn't going to tell them about it you know it's not something it's not it, it makes me sad it makes me sad you might as well be going to a village of people who are illiterate they might be great people but they're very ignorant you know and and, and religiously spiritually there's a lot of people who are a part of a religion that they are ignorant and their leaders are ignorant when it comes to the book and the Word of God the book that they say that they're following it's like this isn't hard to figure out right this isn't something where you have to take sides well do I believe that guy or do I believe the other guy uh, well you don't have to just guess we got a book here so if the if the religion is supposed to come from the book the good news is that we've got a book to verify which one of these guys knows what they're talking about and which one's an idiot. Okay? Oh, yeah, I know. So we got all the ignorant zealots saying who all the false teachers are. Little problem, because they haven't read the book. How can you point out who's wrong and who's right if you didn't at least read the book? Okay? Once you read the book, you still got a lot of work to do to understand it. But if you haven't read it, then you already don't understand it, no matter what delusion you tell yourself. Okay? It just doesn't work that way. So I always encourage people and drive people back to Torah study and to Bible study. I don't care what it is. If you want to be a, a, a Christian, a New Testament Christian, you want to say, hey, I don't believe the Old Testament. First of all, I would highly suggest you read that, the whole Bible, so that you can figure it out. But you know what? Even if you only read your New Testament and knew it, you'd find all the flaws with the things that you think. Because you heard a pastor say it, and you kind of... Uh, took one sentence out of context and you've heard that one you know oh we're we're under grace I heard that one before and we're not under the law and um, you know believe in him and we'll be saved and you've got like you've got all of about 25 words out of a document that's tens of thousands of words and you're walking around thinking you understand it you don't you don't understand your New Testament you don't understand your Old Testament and you don't understand the Bible that they all go into I mean until people especially religious people can wake up and read the book that they're basing their life on that they're basing their eternal life on that they're criticizing other people of that they're that they're running people out of their congregation because well he doesn't believe in the trinity and he doesn't believe this and it's like it's i laugh at that conversation really the trinity have you touched the soul of God? Have you, can you tell me how tall the spirit is? How big that is? Where does it stop and where does it start? How much does it weigh and what's God's voice sound like? You don't know any of those things. So are you going to cast someone away because they don't believe in your idea of the Trinity, which is based by horrible interpretations of a couple verses of a book you've never read and neither is your pastor. Things that are already complex even if you did understand the book. You know, it's ridiculous. It's it's just ignorant and it's ridiculous. And yet people, you know, no, I got it, I know. I know. All about the Trinity. And if you don't believe in the Trinity, well, you're a heretic. Well, trust me, you don't know about the Trinity. You don't even know about the concept of a trinity and what a trinity would be even historically mathematically you know most of the people who are talking are uneducated on almost all levels not even religious levels just levels of you don't even understand um, how basic mechanics how things work math a lot of stuff okay we're at a deficit here
The most zealous people are typically the most ignorant people. That's why it's so scary. I feel sorry for anybody who has to come under under the, the siege of ignorant religious people. It's scary. You know, because they start getting zealous with not enough information and they run out and do dumb things. You know, the information's there. Trust me. If you want to be a zealous wacko when you're all done, you'll still be able to. But if you get people actually reading that word of God, what you're going to find out is you're going to have less zealous wackos. It's going to humble you, okay, if you actually study it. Not look into it to skim over it and find what you already think you know, but actually study it to find out what it is to correct what you don't know, okay? If you do that and you come at it, it's a whole nother story. And, and again, that seed will bear some incredible fruit. Now, we start off this week's parashah. Commandments, yes or no? What does it say? Blessings if you obey the commandments. Okay? And a curse if you will not obey. It doesn't say believe, have faith. It doesn't say believe in my son. It doesn't say do ten Hail Marys. It doesn't say sprinkle some water, see Jesus in a piece of toast. It doesn't say any of those things. Okay? You want blessings? It's real clear right here where you get them. You get them from obeying the commandments. If you don't, he's very nice to paint the other side of the picture just in case we get confused. Curse on the other side, okay? Curse, no obey. So do we got commandments, yes or no? That's the first thing, right? Because there's whole segments of Christianity that believe the commandments are going to wear, that I think in the past, the dispensation, it's blah, it's this, Jesus did away with it, he fulfilled it, he ended all that. Where we got all that stuff, we're not in all that. Okay, so just to get your answer here, you know, just like uh, taking a note here. So commandments is a no for you, right? Keep commandments, obey commandments, no. Okay, let me just check my book here, the Word of God, the Bible of Jesus, right? All of his followers. Uh, there's no New Testament during his preaching of to all the disciples and all of that. Their Bible was the Old Testament. So let's just take a quick peeky here of what their Bible would say if they said they were saying no one obeying the commandments. Oh yes, it says right here in Deuteronomy 11.28, a curse. Okay? That's what it says. If we're not sure, let's just be careful. Let's go down to Deuteronomy 11.32. And you shall observe to do... Can I do some of them? Uh, let's see. And you shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. Okay? That's what it says. doesn't say some... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep a couple. I'm going to keep the... It doesn't say, well, we'll keep the moral law, but we're going to do away with uh, the sacrificial system and the ritual. And, you know, because we've divided this all up into separate things. And let me throw in a little bit of, uh, let's not do this one. Let's throw some of this. And, you know, religious people do that. They're just making stuff up. There's no religious and, and ritual law and moral law. Okay, that's a man-made idea in order to pretend that we can divide a part up and then cut it off. It's like saying, hey, you shall not cut your body. Okay, well, here's what I'm going to do, right? Uh, my nail, you know, it's only this long, so if it grows and I get new nail, I can cut that off because technically it's not part of uh, my body right now, so it's going to be part of the future, so we're going to do something different in the future. No, it doesn't work like that. At the end of the day, they just wanted to recategorize something so they could do it and cut it off anyway. It's like saying, well, my gallbladder, I don't need that for anything, so I guess I can cut that out. That's probably okay because we don't know what it does. We probably Our body doesn't need it. That's Western medicine for you. If we don't think we need it, yeah, I'll cut it out. And I'm thinking, no, if it's in there, you should keep it. I think God put it in there for a reason. doesn't matter whether you know why it's there or not. You keep it. 
You see, that's the difference. That's the difference in mindset. Some people, they, they want to throw it out. I love this week's parish shop because some people just don't read A. They're the blind ones. When the Pharisees said, are we blind, right? Are we religious leaders? Are you saying we're blind? Probably it can't be that. Yeah, yeah, it is. So there might be people say, that, oh, we've got to keep all the command." Well, you're not saying like all of them, right? You're like, yeah, all the commandments. That's what it says. Now, do we live in a Torah-based society? Are we, uh, if there's a guy out there who is gathering kindling on the Sabbath, you know, is is Moshe going to go ask God if he should be stoned and take him out and everybody stones him? No, we don't have that type of setup right now. But if God was back here, that's exactly what I believe will happen. It'll be just like it was before. When God's in the camp, well, then he'll set up his leaders. He'll set up his judges, and when there's an issue of someone doing something, it's going to come before God. And yeah, it's not going to be, uh, uh, you know, oh, I forgive you, anything's okay. No, there'll likely be death penalty, just like there was before for certain sins, and, and not all sins are death penalty. You know, there's other judgments and rulings. But the fact is, it'll be just. Do I think that people should go out there and and put their hand to the witch's throat? No. You're not in a Torah-based society. You're not the just judge. You also don't even know the Torah, so please, please don't do that. Please don't go and be super zealous in your own ignorance. Because that's what it comes down to. I'd be afraid of the people trying to carry out uh, a capital punishment or even some of the basic uh, things in Torah especially when they impact others, when people are a little bit crazy. Yeah. And ignorant. And I don't want them running around thinking that they're doing God's duty and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna run this false teacher out and, and do all that. You know, people are doing that still. And most of the time they're wrong. They're either the false teacher who's running out the person who has the truth, but they can't see it, or they're a false teacher who's running out another false teacher and doing harm to him and running around and teaching and misleading all these other people into thinking they're right. They must be right if they're running out a false teacher. No. Every false teacher gets their own little uh, group of people who believe them. Right? Because nobody is studying the Word of God. So they don't know if the person they're talking to is a big, fat liar or not. Study the Word of God. That solves the problem. So next we get in this week's parasha, and it talks about idols. So all this is going to be about how we see things differently and how we have to be different. You see, at the end of the day, if a person says they follow God or they're a Christian or this and that, and they keep not the commandments, what it all comes down to is commandments, yes or no. You're going to go no. So then I can identify you with all the other pagan nations who don't obey God. Okay, you fall into that category. Doesn't matter what you say, because you don't keep the commandments. So I can look it up right here and go, hmm, all right, looks like here the verse says, okay, that's going to be a curse. Not for me to carry out. I'm not going on a crusade against you. Okay, that's between you and God. But if you think that you're going to be stocking up a whole bunch of blessings and you can't wait to get to heaven to see your mansion, well... If you don't obey the commandments, I'm going to tell you what you're going to see probably is not going to be a mansion. Okay? It's not going to be blessings. Because the Word of God says it right here. It's going to be cursings. So you're saving yourself up a whole bunch of cursings. And you're going to get, as it says, he's going to come and he's going to bring his reward. Good rewards for those who are righteous. And punishment, the reward of punishment for those people who are wicked. Who break his commandments. I mean, that's it. So again, what is it? Commandments, yes or no? What can I mark you down for? Okay? Don't tell me how, why, all oh, that doesn't matter. Because these are the basics, the measuring stick that it's outlined right here in the Bible, and it's always been that way. It starts in Genesis, goes up through, right? And the day that you eat thereof, you'll surely die. And the serpent comes and says, nah, that's nice. Are you sure you're going to die? You know, 
uh, you know, actually, you're going to be like God. He knows, you know, you know, your eyes will be open, and blah, 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 and trying to resell them on something. And all you got to do is look at that and go, okay, Hava, Eve, what was it? Eat the fruit or not eat the fruit? Okay, because God said, eat the fruit, die, don't eat the fruit, live. So what, what, what can I mark you down for? Oh, well, she looked at it. It should make, it looks good for food. There's one excuse, justification. Uh, it should be something to make you wise. And she ate it. So let me just get this straight. I'll just mark you down for eat and die. Okay, because that's what the Word of God says. Someone's trying to sell her that it was part of God's plan to disobey his commandments. Doesn't work that way in the beginning. Doesn't work that way here in Parashat Re'e. And it doesn't work that way in the New Testament either. They don't know the New Testament. To see the multitude of times it tells you about keeping the commandments. And not breaking them. And don't even think I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. But that's exactly what they think. But even in reading uh, Matthew 5, they disobey even the words that they use to say, see, he fulfilled it. And it's like, really? How about you read that sentence aloud and listen to yourself saying when it says, think not I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. And they're telling me that this verse, when it says he fulfilled them, is the proof that he did away with it. Even though the very first half of that sentence says, don't even think this. Uh-oh, we have the same pattern. Here's the first part of the sentence, just like the commandment given by God in the very beginning. And then somehow in the end, they try and twist the end of that sentence to make it say the opposite of what's clearly said in the very beginning of that sentence. This is the same pattern as the serpent in the garden. It's pretty clear when God says don't eat from the tree. But if you start listening to a snake and it starts twisting the truth, and splitting the tongue and lying, then before you know it, the salesman got you talked into it, and now you're thinking the exact opposite. You're thinking, oh, I'm going to get rewards by breaking God's commandments. No, you're not. But sooner or later, God shows up in the garden and sees what you did, and then you try and point the fingers and say, oh, but I, but you know, the wife you gave me, and oh, the serpent tricked me, and on and on, and it don't matter. Curse, curse, curse. All three of them got a curse. Any blessings handed out there for disobeying? Was she? Did she become like God? Was it good for her to eat that? Was it good for food like she thought? Did she become like God? Right? Was she blessed with life? Or did all of those lies that were told to her to sell her that garbage package to get her to ultimately just break the commandment? Did any of that help her out? Was she able to blame the misinterpretation of the scriptures that the serpent tricked her? No. Each person involved was cursed. Nobody there was blessed. No blessings. Because if you... A curse, it says in verse 28, if you will not obey the commandments. So he cursed the land... Right? He said to, to Adam, because you listened to your wife, right? He cursed her in childbirth, and he cursed the serpent. And then he kicked them out of the garden, out of his presence. Get away from me. Just like Messiah says. Many come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, he says, get away from me. You who do lawlessness, you who broken the commandments, get away. There will be a pushing away from, from the Holy One. Messiah, the one who kept the commandments perfectly, that of all things that he's known for, of all key things that made him the Messiah and the Son of God, that made him the Messiah that, that people would be looking for, is because he was perfectly obeying the commandments. And as he said, anyone who keeps the commandments and teaches others to do so, right, to do the same, he will be called greatest in the kingdom. I don't know about you, but when his title's the King of Kings, I don't think he's least in the kingdom. I don't think he's the guy who came and broke the commandments or taught someone to, that it's okay to break the commandments. We don't got to do that anymore. I fulfilled that. Uh, no. Let's plug our brains in. 
Let's use logic and rational thought, and let's come out of the darkness. You know, in the scriptures, darkness is equal to ignorance, okay? Darkness is equal to ignorance. Look it up. You see, and people, right, who needed to see the light, Messiah was called the light, it's to bring them out of that ignorance. That's the first thing. But most people hate the light, as he said. Why? Because they they were of a different faith, uh, because they didn't believe in Jesus, um, because they weren't really nice people. What was it? It says because their deeds. Do you notice the patterns? Didn't we just talk about that earlier? Their deeds, just like the same deeds that he opened up the book of life, just like the same deeds that he measured when he said, looked on the children who were claiming to be the chosen people. Oh, there's a little pattern here. Everybody wants to claim something, and what Messiah and what God looks at is their deeds and measures them against the Torah, whether they're obeying or not. It's that simple. It hasn't changed from page one. It doesn't change by the end of Revelation. As a matter of fact, just as it says, he's going to open up the book of life and judge everyone according to their deeds. Right? I mean, this is how it works. That's how we're measured. We're measured. The whole concept of grace, oh, well, we're under grace. Oh, yeah, well, just do a study. Because when you say that, I can tell you haven't read the book. I can also tell you've never looked up every word, every time that word grace is used. You don't know where it was first used. You don't know the context of every time it's used. You haven't run through and do that. So don't teach me about grace when you don't know about grace. You don't know what biblical grace is. You don't know what the word is. You don't know what it is in Hebrew. You haven't looked at the ancient Hebrew pictographs to see what the meanings that make up the letters that make up that word are. Okay? So trust me a little something here. You don't know what grace is. You are living in your own delusion. You are living in your mind of what you think because you kind of heard a pastor who never read the Bible and you read three verses out of a huge book and now with your armed with your three quarters of five sentences and uh, lies from somebody who you trust that you don't know because you didn't do your due diligence to know what they know because you don't know because you don't study either. You've come to this great conclusion that you're going to school me on what a meaning of something is. A person who's read the book, a person who's looked at every context, a person who's looked at it in the Hebrew and in the ancient Hebrew, and who's categorized all of its uses and looked at what it was associated with in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And is there any change? Is there anything significant? Should I, should I think that it's different in the Old Testament than the New Testament? Because here's the context of how it's used every single time. Well, see, I have done those studies. So I'm happy to talk about grace with somebody. Because what you'll see is that the foundation of grace is if I have found favor in your sight. It's the number one phrase that word is used in. It is always associated in the mass majority, not always in every use, but if you write them all on a piece of paper in context and see what's around them, what's, what are they talking about when they say it, what's in that same sentence, what are the verbs of the sentence that it's used, what are the adjectives, you, you know, do your work, study if it matters. But to be lazy and argue with people who actually care about it and who do study, you know, it's a waste of time. See, the fact is, is that it's all there. You don't have to listen to me. It's in your book. Open up your book. There's a great tool. It's called eSword, e-sword.net. Let you can, you can do a word search in five seconds, even if you're lazy and don't want to look it all up. You can grab a strong concordance if you want to do it manually. There's 50 ways you could learn the answer. You don't know the answer because you don't care, but you think you have the answer because you're lazy. That's, right, with no dressing, that's the basic truth. Okay, so you should be challenged and encouraged. I don't want to seem, you know, rough, too rough on people. Okay, but until we wake up, right, if this matters to you, Prove me wrong, but don't don't be so petty and to try and prove me wrong. Just go study the word for yourself to know the truth, not my truth, but the truth. Come back and teach me. 
Come back and show me the great things that you found. Come back and tell me, hey, I've read this book. I read the whole thing from cover to cover. Then I did these word studies. Then I looked at this. Isn't this interesting? I've been studying this now year after year. And look at the patterns that I found. And look at what this is saying. Like, hey, I want that conversation. Trust me. And if we came to different conclusions, then we could dig in and go, oh, that's crazy. Because, see, the reason I have a little problem with what you're saying is what about these things? And then you'd be like, hey, that I need to know this. Maybe I am wrong. Because we both co come together humbly and we say, hey, you know what? Let's study this here. Okay, well, what about these things? That change And then you actually have fruitful fellowship. And what might come out is the actual truth that anyone could benefit from. Instead, everyone just tries to package up what they think. Uh, and they're flawed lies and sell them to everybody else. Like they're awesome. Okay? That is a waste of time. Why should I trade my lie for your lie? That's what most fellowship is about. Or we all love the same package of lie. High five. We're the seed of Abraham. Boom! What? Oh, the living word of God just called us the seed of the devil. Uh, he's probably wrong. You know, what's he know? Who's this? Isn't this the... Just the son of Yosef? I mean, who is this guy? What school did this guy go to? Right? Doesn't he know who we are? These are the kind of things they said to the Messiah. They tried to find out how he's wrong, poke he's wrong. They tried to do everything, even to the point that they killed him. Instead of just looking at themselves and thinking, hmm, maybe I'm wrong. Bom, bom, bom. Yeah. Great chance of that. Great chance. But if it's not even an option, then you're stuck trying to chase the Messiah down and kill him. Yelling in the crowd, crucify him! Be like, oh, I wouldn't say that. I'm one of his disciples. I am a child of God. I'm his servant. I hear that from tons of people. He's the word of God. That's how he's called. He lived in perfect obedience. That's what he did. That's how he was identified. As the Messiah. That's what made him the Messiah. Okay? He's the Word of God. He lived it perfectly and obeyed it. If you don't know the Word of God and don't obey the Word of God, I don't know who you are. You're just another voice in the crowd saying, we're the seed of Abraham. You can believe it all you want until he shows up and says, no, you're going to see the devil. Before he shows up and says, get away from me, I never knew you. Before he shows up, he gathers you up to be burnt in the barn because you're a tear. You don't know you're a tear. You're flopping around going, I think I'm a wheat. Unlikely. It's unlikely you even know what a wheat is or what a tear is. Even he told his own servants, don't go pluck them out. You won't know. The angels know. But people say, no, 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 I know. Even though the word of God says I don't, I do. Because I know more than the Word of God, and I'm a wheat, and I know what wheat are, and I know what tares are. No, you don't. No, you don't. You just simply don't know. I don't have to convince you. You don't even have to convince yourself. Your delusion means nothing. It means mostly something to you. doesn't mean anything to me. doesn't mean anything to the world. It doesn't mean anything to the Word of God. Because the truth is the truth. So you can walk around thinking you're anything. You can think you're a frog. You can think you're a robot. It don't matter. It really doesn't. But you're wasting your time walking around thinking you're a robot when you're not. That's just called being crazy. Okay? And there's a lot of crazy religious people out there. So we're talking about idols. See, the world worships their own imagination and creation. It doesn't matter how much you believe it. It just doesn't matter. You think you've got all your facts and figures figured out you pull in a couple verses to substantiate what you believe, guess what? Every wacko out there has a verse to prove what they believe. It's going to take a lot more than that to get down to the actual truth. As a matter of fact, that should give you a red flag that, wow, there's a lot of different beliefs can come out of this book. Hmm. If I'm a logical person, then I'd have to think, well, what if I'm believing one that's not right? I have to really study because there's tons of unlearned people who come up with hundreds of theories out of the same book. So did I just happen to come across the truth just because it's my theory or it's the first theory I came up with? 
actually, statistically, I think, and logically, you should come to the conclusion that the great chance, high probability is, is that you'll come up with lies, just like everybody else did. But if you go in knowing, hey, it's a good chance I'm going to come up here, I'm going to think it's one way and it's going to be a lie, like, you're already smarter than most of the people at that point, if you go in knowing that and being prepared for that. Just like Messiah said, if you knew you were blind, then I could heal you. Because you say you see, your sin remains with you. And it's just pride. You don't understand what you don't understand. Since you think you understand something, you're wrong and delusional. Okay? See, idols are really about life or death. See, some people worship idols. Just like many people have different forms of, of worship. What they can't see is they got all the things. We've got a, a ritual. We've got things that matter to us. We've got symbols. We've got prayers. We've got names. We've got organizations. We get together. We fellowship. We worship. Right? But every idol worshiper does the same thing. That should scare you. You should be worried. Could I be doing a false form of worship? Could I have gotten involved in a system that is surrounded with all of these different things and beliefs and reasonings and all this and that, but it could still be a lie? It says, what's that in your hand? You know, that's a lie in your hand. Uh, idols are called a lie or vanity. They're called both those things in the scriptures. In this week's Parashat, of course, it talks about destroying all the idolatry utterly in the land. Another way of saying that is, you better do a lot of Torah study. How do you destroy lies? By learning the truth. By examining the text. By studying hard and learning deeper so that you can see what's a lie, so you can see the patterns, so that you can try and get past the misunderstandings. Maybe you misunderstand a whole section. Great. Go on. Read the rest of the book. Read it all. Figure out every piece that you think you can, knowing that you could be totally wrong, and then go back and read it again and do it again and do it again, and slowly some of those things, it works itself out. Even the great delusions with enough study, honest study, will, will destroy the lies and the misunderstandings. Not if you go back through and go, well, I got this all figured out, so let me just go read it again now that I already know how it works. No, you can't study that way. you got to go in and go, okay, i got to try and pretend that I don't know anything about the scriptures and take them at face value. What would I get if this was the first time my eyes ever read this? And if you do that all the time, you'll double check yourself to make sure you're not, am I going straight? You have to assume you're going straight. Assume you misunderstood it last time. Assume you don't understand the pattern. Assume all those things. Right? If you do that, you're going to get the truth, I believe. I, I truly believe, just as Yode Wahe chose Moshe, because it says he was the humblest man on all the earth. See? He picks the humble. The ones who are willing to humble themselves. He'll teach you. He'll open it up. Knock, and the door will be open to you. The humble person has to knock. The proud person tries to kick in the door, or stands outside believing the delusion that they're inside and telling themselves, I am inside. I do have light in my candle, even though they sit in darkness. And as long as we're all here chanting together, and we formed a, a congregation and a ministry and a synagogue and a church, then we all, are, we're the church of the open eyes inside uh, the, the congregation. That could be their name. The church of the holy open eyes. No. You're still blind. Just because you made the name. The name means nothing. God calls you a person with open eyes. You have open eyes. Most likely he'll call you blind. And then you'll disagree with him. Because you disagree with the truth. Because you don't want the truth. And you don't believe the truth. And you know that the truth doesn't line up with you. And that is the reason. It says they hate the light because their deeds are dark. They're not one. They're not a hod with the truth, and therefore they hate it, and they reject it, and they will not accept it. That's what happened with Mashiach. He came back, he's the living word, he's the truth, he spoke the truth, and people didn't want to believe it, it didn't line up with what they were already doing, with their traditions, with all that other stuff, and so they killed him and got rid of him. Now if he'd have come back and said, hey, you guys are all doing a great job, all of you religious leaders are so good, let me reward you for, for keeping my flaw, blah, 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 it would have been a whole different story, and that's what they wanted. 
but it didn't happen that way. And I don't think it's going to happen that way again. See, idols are dead. They're just a piece of wood and stone. That's the whole point. That's not God. God is living. He's not dead. God is spiritual. He's not a piece of the earth. We're earthly. He's spiritual. Right? That's what the New Testament says. So we must worship him in spirit. The, the point is, is that he's not what you've made him out to be. Idolatry is what you've made him out to be, what you want him to be. How you see God doesn't matter. That's just your idol. That's like going into the scriptures and reading it to have it verify what you think you already know because you think you already know the scriptures. No, you don't. You don't know that page. You don't know that verse. You don't know that meaning. And if you go into it with that, your eyes might start to open up and you'll actually see the truth. You'll see something new that you hadn't seen before. It'll correct you. It'll give you real truth. That's what it takes. So we get next to your offerings. The offerings in here, he talks about. You don't just, you know, when you come into the land, you don't just uh, do your offerings wherever you want, however you want. He talks even about the tithes, specific authoring, or offerings. You see, there's guidelines. There's blessings. The blessing is coming into the land. And the pattern it creates is that even the blessings that you will receive from God, they come with strings. They come with guidelines. They come with requirements, right? The blessings right here, it says, a blessing if, right? A kev. If you obey the commandments. It doesn't say a blessing without obedience. It doesn't say commandment. Obedience is optional. No, obedience is. Is. Haya. Right? This is the Akev. If. Blessing one side. On the other side, obey the commandments. Blessing. If obey. If obey. Blessing. Okay? This is simple. It's a requirement. You can't split the baby in half. You love a dead baby. You can't say, well, I think I'm going to get blessings. I don't know that I have to keep it. Yes, you do. Well, I'm not doing it, you know, let's name on both. No. No obey. No blessing. Blessings. Obey. They're right there. Cursings. Disobey. So you come back right there and say, okay. Even the blessings, just like the offerings, have requirements and guidelines. It isn't anything goes. Just because God blesses you and brings you in the land doesn't mean, okay, great, we can do what we want now. No, there's a whole set of guidelines and everything into everything that you do. Oh, wait, we got the promised land. Let's just, let's just plant a, a fruit tree and let's just eat from it. And it's like, wow, these are the biggest uh, apples I've ever had in my life. No. God put guidelines on when you plant and when you can eat it and what you do the first year and the second year and, and all this and that. You don't just get to do because you did what you were supposed to to have him bring you into the promised land. It doesn't work like that. Once you get in, there's other guidelines. People don't want to learn any of the guidelines. They don't want to read the book. They don't want to learn the guidelines. It's like, what, what makes you think you'd be a citizen in that kingdom? You don't even know how to act. Okay? This is how we act. This is how you become. This is your book of citizenship into the kingdom. Okay, Study. Just like an immigrant wants to come to, to the United States, what do they do? they got to study. They get books. They study the laws. they got to make sure they don't break them. they got all these regulations and guidelines. And if they mess up, bam, you're out of here. Because if you want to come and be part of this place and, and, and this this nation, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to give you guidelines and rules. And if you don't want to learn them, you want to be lazy, and you either accidentally or on purpose break them, doesn't matter to us. You're out of here. It's no different for the kingdom of heaven. This is the mercy that we have this time to study and do all this. Next, it goes into eating blood. That again, we say, how do we see things differently? How do we be differently? Right? The offerings, pagan nations, made offerings to their God. But what we can see differently is that, that we aren't to do the things the nations did in the way that they did. Okay? We have to see it differently. Because God does have offerings that we're supposed to do. Now, are we just slaying a lamb? You know? Because we made a mistake and no biggie, I got a whole bunch of lambs? No. 
We're supposed to see what that means. It's supposed to have meaning beyond the surface. And it's supposed to cause us to see things differently and to be different and to understand what that lamb is and what it represents and what it represents to God and to learn from all this stuff. That's why you can't be stuck at the literal level. Okay? You've got to get to the spiritual level and then to the level of understanding, of understanding the different levels. I mean, there's a lot more to it than what people think. And they're wasting their time. You know, the exam's coming and they don't spend any time studying their textbook. And guess what? I can tell you what's going to happen. You're not going to pass the class. And if you don't pass the class, you're not going to get your uh, degree and your diploma. And then you're going to have other trouble and you're going to have debt. And you'll have no diploma and no degree, which isn't going to help you. It'll end up actually hurting. I mean, it doesn't matter which pattern you look at. They all say the same thing. So eating blood, we're commanded in this parish on to eat blood. And this is, again, a separation, notice the pattern, of the flesh and the blood. See, the blood was important in that animal. It made them live long enough that you could kill that animal and eat and that you could live and extend your life. The blood carried that animal there. But when it comes time to eat it, we're flesh. It says the life is in the blood. So we're trying to continue our flesh, right? So we eat the flesh. The blood is the life there. It gets poured back out. We don't consume the life of it, okay? We, we consume the flesh of it. And it was given. That part was given to us. Both parts weren't given. God says, okay, there's an animal. You can kill it and eat it. But, right? Here's my conditions. But you're going to need to pour the blood out like water on the ground. Okay? You're hungry. You've got a desire. But it isn't anything goes. This is how we have to be willing to see the details. It was funny because I was just talking to someone and telling them about the uh, Sherlock BBC series. And, you know, Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, what does Sherlock Holmes do? He makes observations. He walks into a room, just like the CSI show uh, or, or any of those shows, the person who walks in, nobody knows what happened. But the expert walks in and they make observations. They re a they behold it differently than everyone else. Everyone else walks in and goes, oh, I don't know what happened. This person over here is dead, blah, blah, blah. And then the expert, like Sherlock, comes in and says, oh, I can see what happened. The person came in through the window. It was about 10 o'clock. He went over here, and they must have known each other because he got... And it, and it goes on this whole little thing of all these observations that he made. Because he can see things that other people can't. Why? Because they're ignorant. Not because he's smarter than them. His mind and his observation is better trained than they are, so that when he comes on, he sees about five times as much information as they do. Because they didn't take the time to learn how to see all those details to be able to then also understand and put those details together. They're in the same room, just like we use the same book. A lot of people use the same Bible. How come some people can see it and get it and all that, and other people can't see it? And can't get it. They can't figure out that this book is about obeying the commandments and about obedience. That's the number one thing in this whole book from start to finish. Obeying God. From the first interaction of God and man all the way to the end, it starts and ends with obedience. It's not about being from a chosen tribe, and it's not about salvation. Those are all elements. Those are all pieces that have an importance, but they aren't the key factor. The key factor that goes all the way through from beginning to end is obedience to God. And it's, and it's grossly, it's grossly the most common thing talked about. Ten times more than who, what tribe you're from or you're chosen from God. Ten times more than talking about salvation or something like that. So can't we see the obvious? Can't we look at, at it, write it all down and go, well, you know, 5,000 times it said we have to obey. Oh! But 152, it says, you know, it's talking about salvation. So the book's probably about salvation. It's like, really? That's what you came up with. You didn't come up with the 5,000 that this is the big thing. It's like a kid who doesn't understand a, 
a little rock and a big rock. Now, which one's the big one? And they're like pointing to the little one. That's when you understand the kid doesn't know the answer. You know, no, 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 let's teach you this. You don't pat him on the head when he points to the wrong answer and say, wow, little Timmy's so smart. No, little Timmy isn't smart. He doesn't know anything about big and little yet. If I want him to know about big and little, i got to spend more time and teach him. Okay? If you want to know the difference between big and little, read the book. You read the book. It's going to be pretty obvious. Okay? That's always why it is easy for me to understand. doesn't matter if they're a Torah teacher or they got a DVD set that they're selling and a newsletter with 5,000 people. I can tell after about five minutes they haven't read that book. It's like, hmm... Let's hook them up to a polygraph here and ask them if they've read the whole thing, every word of it, from the first page to the end, even once. Because some people may even lie and say, no, I've read it, I've read it. Most people won't lie. They'll avoid that question when I really keep asking it. And then when they say that they have, then I have to think, how did you read that whole book and not get the obvious thing that kept repeating itself over and over? Why did you strain at the gnat? Why did you look at the small thing that was mentioned here a few times, and then you swallow the camel, right? The huge thing. You can't, you don't notice the huge thing. And you think that the small is large and the large is small. Yeah, it talks about people who do that. It's called Good, Evil, and Evil, Good. And it's all there. It's just, it's a wonderful book. It's a huge book, and it's definitely um, a challenge, but it's definitely something that isn't beyond anybody's grasp. Um, next we see in this week's parish all the signs, wonders, and prophets. Uh, you know, notice what happens. It's sad to say, but what do they do to the prophet who teaches them something other than God? Go worship this other God. They burn the whole city. It shall not be rebuilt again. Well, what if the people were led astray by that prophet and they didn't know? They're killed, and the whole city is burned. So you better be careful when you're listening to a serpent who tells you you don't have to obey the commandments of God. This is actually God. This is how God is. Let me reinterpret for you the word of God. Let me tell you it's really this, and it's really his plan that you don't have to obey anymore. And, and let me tell you all these things, and you're going to get rewards even though you're doing wickedness, and you don't have to obey. Like, you're following that? You're following that person. That's what this week's parashah talks about. That city that goes out and follows that false prophet. The whole city will be burned a heap. It doesn't say any of it's going to be left around. Not the animals, not the spoil, nothing. What's redeemable out of that? Well, you know, you can't criticize all of those people. You know, they didn't know, and the pastor lied, and he didn't read the book. But then again, then they didn't read the book, and they could have solved it that way. If anybody reads the book, they could probably maybe figure it out and get the heck out of there. Um, yeah. Don't hold on to it. Surely they'll keep our $25,000 sound system. They're not going to destroy that. Didn't we have good music? We're like, hey, God, Jesus, hey, we love you. Can we keep that? Whole thing's destroyed. The false form of worship is destroyed utterly. There's only one form of worship. There's only one form of following on, uh, God. It's obeying his commandments. That's what it is. If you don't know the commandments, you study. And you study to learn how to obey. And that's it. The rest works itself out. No, you don't need to know who the third writer of the apocalypse is. Honestly, I think, you know, it'll figure itself out. You know, if the time comes and we know that, hey, just like the prophecy says, you'll be blessed for the people who know the prophecy. doesn't necessarily mean who've dissected what the prophecy means. So many people fall into that trap. They want to, they're getting so concerned with, oh, what about the nature of God? And what about the third writer of the apocalypse? It's like, what about what's going on in the Gaza Strip? I don't know, who cares? Because until you figure out how to obey your blessings and cursings, you haven't even covered the basics. You're a baby who doesn't know the difference between big and small yet. Let's work on that before you start working on calculus. Okay? I know you're eager, but let's let's go, Johnny. You're still pooping your pants. Let's get you to be able to stand up 
and tell the difference between one thing and another. Then we'll move on to the next part. It's all progressive. So then we get the kosher reading in this week's parashat. And uh, this is about seeing the details and understanding the patterns. That's what it is. You got to re a. You got to notice that, hey, I'm looking at the details. What type of hoof does it have? Is it cloven or not? I can't see. Is it chewing the cut? Is it not? You know, some of them have the cloven hoof, but they're not chewing the cut. I need to know these things. Oh, does it have fins and scales? Right? This is red A. Other people eat. They don't look at what's going in their mouth. It's one of the hugest problems in our world right now. Companies like Monsanto are putting out chemicals, preservatives, and, and GMOs, and all this other garbage, and, and all the stuff that's in our food, and people think that that doesn't make a difference. People don't recognize that, hey, we didn't used to have all these health problems. Now we have a hundred different pills you have to take and a hundred different new sicknesses and they got to come up with new names for these sicknesses because there's so many weird things happening and it couldn't possibly be that we've been eating chemicals for uh, for 30 or 40 years now that we've never really ate before that and that those chemicals came from uh, from World War uh, two and and all the uh, the chemicals they used in warfare and everything and then they said hey where are we going to do this? Oh, look, there's a commercial market we can put over here in the food industry. Let's make it for that. You know, let's move our, our, our all of our stuff, our, our Agent Orange and our DDT, and let's move it over here and, and, and tell people that it's good to eat this stuff so we can sell it to people. When we were using it before to kill people. It's like, wake up. You can't put that stuff in your body and think it doesn't matter. They're engineering ways that you can't stop eating the potato chips, literally, because they put a chemical in there to alter your brain chemistry so that you can't stop eating them. And yet people, you know, I go over and I see people eating all that garbage sitting on their table. And why don't they know about it? Again, ignorance. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I believe it. You're destroyed in every way for lack of knowledge whether it's the scriptures, whether it's about food, whether it's about uh, the economy, whether it's about anything, basic education, it doesn't matter. You've got to be growing. So as my father is a gardener and I am the true vine. So pretty sure he's into growth, right? Parable of the talents. The problem with the one guy, the zero growth. He said, you could have at least put it in the bank. I could have got some interest, but no growth. What happened to the fig tree? Bore no fruit. Boom. Cursed. Right? Effort. Growth. That's what we're talking about here. Next, we get to the last part. Uh, and it's a bummer. I was going to put more time into this part. But, you know, all this stuff's taking time. So uh, it's about the poor and your brothers. Well, this fits the category this week because we had the conversation, as I was telling you, where I asked for some help on my uh, wall uh, because we lost some clients and we're running into financial trouble until we can solve it and get more clients and stuff and uh, got a, a few uh, posts or responses that were critical and you know why do you need this and and oh maybe you're being cursed um, and all these different things right um, so I talked to him and said, okay, I think this is the one guy he just uh, he just wanted to keep preaching about uh, he didn't believe in the New Testament and ultimately he thinks that's why it is. You know, if you believe in Messiah, then that's why this is happening, even though his theories were horrible. Logic was horrible. Um, and another gal who who's a, has been a great friend and actually one of the people who, one of the only people when we originally uh, a long time ago ran into trouble and reached out to everybody she was uh, one of the only the only one who had helped us out with a little something and uh, and she had made some posts uh, which some of them I disagreed I think I kind of see where she was coming from but I still don't think that they were probably uh, in the right context of of what was going on and this week's Torah portion talks about this um, and of course, you know, nobody should be, there's scammers out there. And if you're not sure, I mean, you, you shouldn't be throwing your, your money away or helping somebody if you don't feel comfortable. And if you have questions, absolutely ask them. Um, if you know a person and you feel comfortable, 
um, then I think you absolutely should. Um, but again, that goes to our due diligence. We need to be diligent in asking because you can't ask a question so that you can walk away. And a uh, great example, and, and, and I don't think this is what she was doing at all, but I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen when people say, nah, you know, I go by the person who's uh, begging for money or whatever, and they're like, oh, well, I'm not going to give to them because they're going to go buy beer or they're going to go buy drugs. And it's like, for most people, that's just an excuse to do nothing. No matter how, that's a justification so they can feel okay walking by and doing nothing. Because those same people don't go, but because I want to help them and don't want them to use it for drugs, I'm going to go down to the store and buy them a sandwich and bring it back in a drink. Or I'm going to go buy them a pair of shoes or a coat because it's cold out and he doesn't have a coat. Um, or the sign says that they can't uh, pay their rent. I'm going to go with them to their landlord and pay the rent with them. No, those people don't do that because they have no interest in helping. If they did, that's what they would do. They just use an excuse to justify why they did nothing. Doing nothing is the worst thing. Doing nothing is the saddest thing. It's ridiculous. And, and we justify it to ourselves. So we say, well, you know, okay, wait, I need to give this guy a complete audit. No, if you think, if you don't know who they are or whether they're legit or, or whether they're really in need, that stuff's easy to verify. But if you're going to start saying, well, you know, uh, uh, how many job applications do you put in? And, you know, why is it that you uh, haven't sold your couch? You know, I see you got a nice coat there. Why don't you sell that? I don't want to help you if you haven't already sold your own coat, you know, because I want you sitting on the floor in darkness with one piece of bread for you and, and all your kids and a half glass of water before I'm willing to help you because you don't seem desperate enough. You know, it's like that's just a justification to do nothing. I've seen it so many times it makes me sick. It's sad. And this week's Parashah goes into this. This week's Parashah talks specifically about this and what we should do. And so it says right here, about the Shemitah, the year of release, it says, at the end of seven years, you shall make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lends unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor. Okay? The exact, that word exact, is, is like a slave master. It's like someone who's beating somebody. Or of his brother, because it is called Yore Wahe's release. It says, of a foreigner, you may exact, right? You may pressure them, you may push upon them. But that which is with your brother, you, your hand shall release. It, say, it says, accept or save when there is no poor among you. For Yorewahe shall greatly bless you in the land which Yorewahe gives you for an inheritance possessed. So now we learn that Yorewahe is going to bless you. Okay, There's going to come a time when there isn't any poor among you. And, and you know, if, if there's not poor among you, you know, that's it's a different story. Okay? Someone can pay you back and they, they owe you, you know, they should pay you back. Okay? But when people are in need, it goes right in here. It says right here in verse 4, it says, or 5, it says, Only if you carefully hearken unto the voice of Yori Wahe, your Elohim, to, deserve to, do, to observe to do all these commandments which I command you this day. So right there, the financial blessing is tied to observing to do the commandments. Just like the uh, a couple parashahs ago, I think it was, it said, uh, I think it was two, maybe it was one. No, I think it was two. Um, it says, uh, it says, don't think by the might of your own hand you've gotten this wealth. Yore Wahe gives you the power to get wealth. You know, a lot of people I've I've met over the years, they, they talk with a haughtiness like, well, I've never, you know, I'm doing fine. Why can't you do fine? I got a nice job. Well, you better be careful because Yore Wahe gives you the power. If one person's lost their job and you haven't, you should count that as a blessing to Yore Wahe, not a reason that it's because you or you're awesome or the might of your hand is what's kept you your job. Because God can bring a circumstance to you just as easily as he brought to somebody else. And tomorrow you could not have your job, just like the rich man and Lazarus. Tomorrow you could be the one begging for just a drop of water on your tongue from the person who you scoffed at and walked by every day. That, ah, that lazy person. I'm not sitting there begging. Why are they? 
they could have done everything I did. I've seen that attitude before, and it's just, it's kind of sickening. It's uh, for many reasons. But the whole point is, it's not about an audit. And we're going to see that in, in, in these verses. It says, uh, For Yodewah your Elohim blesses you as he's promised you, and you shall lend unto many nations, but shall not borrow. And you shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. Okay? So it's Yodewahe who blessed him. And it's and it's Yodewahe, just as he says, who makes rich and makes poor. And it's Yodewahe who can give and who can take away. It says in verse 7, If there be among you a poor man of one of your brethren within any of your gates, in your land, which Yodewahe your Elohim gives you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother. You see? It doesn't even say, oh, it's just not about you not giving to them. Actually, it's even the heart with which you respond to them is going to come under subjection, and you're commanded against that. This isn't just something that's like, oh, it'd be nice if you want to help them. No. If you help them with a heart like, oh, I don't really want to, um, you know, you better hurry up and get a job. I'm not going to help you again. I don't even know if I should, you know, um, but at least I can have a clear conscience if, if I help you, then, you know, then at least I can say I did it. You know, I don't want to run into that. If I, if you were hungry and I fed you not kind of thing, and I was thirsty and you gave me not, oh, as you did to all these guys you did to me, you know, little insurance. There's people who give for all different reasons. Some people give because it makes them feel good. It's about them, actually. Because they want to see themselves as righteous and holy or even as a giver. Or it feels good to give. And they don't care what the person does with it. Other people give because they want to help that person, even if it hurts them. Some people give in their abundance. Some people give in their lack. There's lots of motivations and lots of beneficiaries of helping and reasons why someone would help and not help. There's the greedy people who, even though it might make them feel good to help somebody, they love their money more than they even like the feeling that they could give themselves a pat on the back and say, oh, I'm a great guy, like the, the publican. It was like, oh, I'm so good. I, I tithe, you know, from everything I have. And, I, you know, they're, they're actually beneath that level. They're going, eh, that'd be nice to be able to brag about it, but I'd just rather keep my money. And that guy's a dirtbag. He doesn't deserve it. He's lazy. Right? That's a lo level to me lower than the publican. Because ultimately the publicans still tithe. In that scenario of the widow's might, Mashiach actually says that the widow gave more than the publican, even though it was only a tiny bit. But at least the publican gave. He still said he gave a tenth. That was of his excess. That's still better than the person who gives nothing and justifies it and says, well, he's probably going to use it for drugs, or why is this poor person poor? I mean, they're just lazy. They probably could have been as rich as I am because I got my own wealth. They could too. Why didn't they go to labor already? Why didn't they? Uh, why didn't they go out there and dig a ditch? Have they sold all their personal belongings? I saw them. They have a phone. Why do they have a phone? Poor people shouldn't have a phone. Why should I help them if they have a phone? They should be the most destitute person in all the world who sold everything they have, done everything they can, and after all that. And there's nobody in more destitution than them, then I'll give that person something. But you want to know the funny thing is? That person who has nothing and sold all they have and is, is wearing filthy clothes and stinks and is living without a home, is homeless, right? Those are the same people that these people with this harsh eye then say, well, I'm not going to give to them. They're probably going to buy drugs. They're buying drugs because their life's so miserable. Because they have nothing, they sold their home, they lost their home, they sold everything, and no one will help them. So yes, they might go buy some beer to escape from their own reality. You see, but that person who justified why they won't help you because you're doing too well, I won't help you because it's your own fault, I won't help you because there's still options that you could exercise, essentially saying, I won't help you because there's other things in the world that you could do to get help which would keep me from having to help you. Have you checked into the, the, to the Catholic Charities? Have you gone down to the street corner and begged? Isn't there this program? Isn't there that? Essentially, they're saying no. 
So let me mark you down for a no. You're not going to help me when I ask you for help. You're going to redirect me. That's not help. Just so you know, you didn't help me by telling me about a program that I should go look up. Some people think that's helpful. It's not generally. I'm going to I'm going to tell you a little secret. Those programs that everybody feels good because it's like, oh, hey, we're losing our house. Oh, I heard there's a program that will help you keep that. So they walk away, and in their mind they're thinking, I just saved that guy from losing his house. A little pat on my back. That program doesn't exist, and they don't know it. I've gone. I've looked. I've looked at the programs. I've gone to the Catholic Charities. I've gone to the, play, the Salvation Army. I've gone to all these things. And you know what you get? Almost nothing. Okay, I'm going to make another video. It's a whole video about uh, what all the places we went to, all the people we talked to, all the emails we sent, all the people we contacted, the different religions, the philanthropy groups, Messianics, Jews, Christians, organizations, churches, Catholic charities, Salvation Army, uh, government programs, housing programs, all that, okay? Well, I got a whole other video, right? I went and did what the average poor person would never know how to do or be able to do efficiently. I went and did all that. I knew about the programs. I researched. I did all the, you know. I'm going to tell you right now. You know what we got? I got $20 from a lady who was living in her trailer after contacting hundreds of people, after reaching out, getting calling pastors, direct emails to leaders of congregations and, and not didn't get back. Hey, we're praying for you. Hey, we're doing this. Hey, all this and that. I said, oh, you want verification? Maybe you're not sure if it's true. Okay, here, here you go. Here's all my information. Here's my uh, registered business license of the business that I had and, and our website of who we are. Here's references, personal reference, whatever you want. It's all there. So we can't use that as an excuse that, oh, well, maybe it's a scam. No. It's called people don't do anything, and they justify it in a thousand different ways. They justify it in a thousand different ways why they do nothing. So let me just see if I'm going to mark you down here. You're good for nothing, right? You shut your hand, right? Tell me about a program that's a shut in my hand, okay? Uh, wanting to know why I have why I've even asked you why do I why am I asking you for help or anybody for oh okay so that's a I'm gonna mark you down for a hardening of the heart because that ain't help criticizing the person who asked for help that's not even question that's not saying I need to know you're legitimate not some scam from from Africa who is running some uh, money laundering scheme to get money out of people no I need to know you're legit well no oh, oh yeah contact me you want to know oh, it's legit but people don't do that just like the other thing, they didn't want to actually know you're legit. They wanted an excuse. Let me see if I can find a flaw in you. What can I find that gives me a justification, a reason to do nothing? To close my hand, to harden my heart against my brother. Well, I don't know. Let's see what it says here. It says, uh, from your poor brother. It says, but, Deuteronomy 5, 15, 8, you shall, this is a command, open your hand. Oh, just open it? No. Open your hand wide unto him, and shall surely lend him sufficient for his need in what she wants. And then it goes a step further and says, Beware that there not be a thought. Now we're not even talking about whether you did it. We're not talking about how your hand was closed, because that shows you gave nothing. Right? Advice. Program. A criticism, let me mark you down for nothing. Okay? You can't pay a water bill with advice. You can't pay a water bill with criticism. You can't pay a water bill with nothing. Okay? When somebody asks for help, if you're able to help them, now in our case, I said if people don't have that much, don't worry, we'll find a way to be okay. I don't want someone going out there and saying, well, I'm not going to. I'm not, I'm not going to eat lunch this afternoon so I can help. We weren't in that type of situation. So I said, hey, for what we need here, if somebody's in an okay position, great, help us. If not, pray for us, blah, 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 blah. This isn't about me. 
But this is about it in general. If your brother asks for help, you're supposed to open your hand wide unto him, so surely lend to him, sufficient for his need. Right? People aren't doing that. In which he wants, and it says, Beware, lest there that there be not a thought in your wicked heart. Right? Even the way you think about that person who's asking for help. You know, this goes for the critical eye. You need to see that it's not a scam. That's totally different. Contact the person privately. Make sure, verify, find out people who know them, blah, blah, blah. If they're legit, they'll have all that kind of stuff. Do you need to do an entire audit and see uh, last five years tax returns and get a blood sample and find out uh, what you know TV shows they watch and look at their phone records to see if they have ever said anything you don't like? No. Actually, that would be at the point where I believe you'd be sinning. That's not what it's about. And you're not doing that to help them. You're doing that to look for a reason not to help them because of your own wicked heart. You know, these are part of the commandments. You're like, well, I'm not a murderer. Well, guess what? These are the commandments too. We need to step it up a little bit. Okay? Because this is really lacking. It's lacking in in the Messianics. It's lacking in the Christians. Um, and I would say probably uh, the Jews... Uh, Maybe they do good, I think, in their own community, and some Christians do. I think Messianics probably, honestly, because it's so scattered about, um, do less. But everybody's falling pretty short. And, you know, when somebody needs help, if everybody just did a little, just like someone said one time, they were like, hey, look, there's a hundred of us. If everyone, like, you know, pitched in ten dollars, that's a thousand dollars. Boom. I mean, nobody out there, you know, is going to be distraught because of $10. Nobody can't go without a latte or, or you know, hey, I'm going to sell this thing on Craigslist. We never use it. I got a workout machine in my basement. Someone come pick it up for $10, $15. Bucks. I'm going to send it to this other person who needs help. And if a person is in such bad need of help that they can't share 10 bucks, prayer is absolutely free. And on top of that, if you're in that type of situation, don't be so prideful to not raise your hand and say, hey, I'm in a tough spot. Ten bucks is a little too much for me. Because great. Then all of those 999 other people that are going to give ten bucks to this guy to help this person out, guess what? Next week or two weeks when people get paid or whatever it is, next piece of junk that they sell out of their garage or whatever, or, or latte they skip, they can say, hey, Right? Behold, a eyes are open. Is there a need in our community? Hey, this person over here couldn't give ten bucks. Let's help her out. Here's a thousand bucks. Let's get you a little bit better. Ten bucks is gonna break you. You're 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 having a tough time financially. Trust me, not everybody's doing so bad that they can't help. It's about having open eyes to see the need and doing something about it. Just the same pattern that I said about the Torah. It's about studying and then obeying. It's the same thing. First you have to see it, and then you have to respond to it. This is what's lacking. And the last part of this week's parasha is about the feast. It's the same thing. Are we doing things just like other, just randomly going through things and doing traditions? No. The holy days have value and meaning, and we have to each year try and see the meaning. Do what's smart. I was at a congregation. They just wanted to do the traditional stuff. I said, hey, aren't they asking in these questions? Like, when when people say at Passover, Dehenu, it would have been enough. If you just did this, like there's one verse in there where it says it would have been enough if you brought us out of, of Mitzrayim and didn't give us the law. I couldn't say that because that's not true. I know for a fact that wouldn't be enough. We needed the law. Oh, that's not what we mean. I'm not saying it. I can't say it would have been enough for him to bring Israel out of Mitzrayim and not give them the law because that was the whole point of what they needed to be able to go on the promised land. It's a stupid song. It's a stupid tradition. 
And so I was like, well, let's change the wording. But they didn't want to change the wording because it was traditional. We don't want to change the tradition because we want to be like the Jews. Well, so what? It was stupid. And it didn't line up biblically. It was a tradition that was unbiblical. Hey, let's let's have the questions. So the kids ask the question. Does anyone recognize that like two of the questions are actually the same question? And none of them point to Mashiach. So let's ask different questions. No, 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 no. We can't have brains for ourselves. We can't do something that's not tradition. Because that tradition is like an idol. It's something that was passed down. You don't know why you're worshiping it. You're worshiping it because your fathers worshipped it. And they're worshiping it because someone else worshipped it. Because a mountain or a volcano blew up and they thought it was God. I don't know. And I don't care. All those traditions and all those things are passed on, but they're not true. And in religion, there's theologies and there's practices and there's traditions that are passed on, but they don't line up with the Torah and the scriptures. And you've got to be willing to say no to those. And you've got to be willing to open your eyes and try and learn, what do these feasts mean? Every year I need to look at it again. What is this about? What am I supposed to be learning? What am I growing out of this? Am I sure I'm not just doing it? It's not about, ooh, we're going to blow a shafar and we're going to do this. Like those are the outward things, but what is the meaning? Okay? I need to understand that. I need to see things differently than just on the surface. And I need to be different by them. It starts with seeing and then being. Seeing and being. Okay? See the commandments and then be the obedience to the commandments, the living commandment. That's what Messiah did. None of you seem to the Father with me because I come from the Father. He saw the Father. He was being the commandments, the Father. He was called the Word of God, the living, the Word of God made flesh. Why? Because he lived it. He, he was being. He saw the Word and he was being the Word. That's the same thing that we have to do. So till next time, I'm going to say shalom.